We lived nine months in Claremore. We bought the house in, on Labor Day, and she was killed in July. She had washed all three cars that day, that Sunday. And uh, uh, she wanted to go in and fill up. We always went in and filled up our gas tanks on Sunday night before we go to work Monday morning. And uh, we went in after she did, and, and we saw her coming down the Rogers Boulevard, and that was mainly going through. And we waved at her, and that's the last time we saw her. This was a time when kids in Claremore spent their evenings or their, not, their weekends driving up and down Main Street, right back and forth. Uh, the kids used to cruise up and down Will Rogers Boulevard for recreation. And, and then they'd go to the Neymar Center and hang out at Neymar Center. And you got to know Neymar back then. It was uh, a gathering place for teenagers and stuff. On Friday and Saturday nights, you couldn't hardly drive through there. It was so busy. We went back home and thought she'd come on after, you know, she said, I'll be home later. I went ahead and went to bed. And it was the first time I ever went to bed and sleep before she came home. And the next morning, my husband got up. When he got up, he said, Laurie's not home. And we got up and went into town, found her car, and then we went to the police station. When I went in there, well, they can't do anything for 24 hours. The sheriff's department's where we went. My first recollection is when the Longs came to me, told me that their daughter had, was missing. And at that time, I think it was just the one day she didn't come home the night before. I talked them into, they'd gone to the police, and I talked them into waiting. I said, let's, let's wait. I have forever been sorry. If there's anything I'm sorry about, it's that because I've, and, and maybe she was gone by then, but I just have always felt like if I had just done something that day, because I was the second turn of the down that they had. And they came back the next night and I was on duty. You know who Poopy is? Chester Baldwin. Uh, my name is Chester Baldwin. And at the time of the uh, disappearance of Laura Long from Neymar, I had, only been a policeman for about a little over a year. They had found their, her vehicle on the Neymar parking lot. It was not unusual, I don't suppose, to see a car set in Neymar Center with no one in it. And I went with them out there. He said, do y'all have a key? And I said, yes, we do. And he said, uh, well, let me have it. And I said, I don't want you touching that car until we find out what's, what's happened here. And he said, uh, oh, well, I won't do anything. But he did. He went in there and touched everything. What concerned me about it at first was the fact that her purse was in the car and the car was locked up. And I thought most women won't leave their car and won't leave their purse in a car and go off and leave it for any length of time. Still didn't get anybody out there to do fing fingerprints. And I think that was just talking Greek to them. They didn't have any idea that they should do that. And I know they knew better. Back in those days, they weren't trained as well as we we were nowadays. They didn't process stuff like, I don't think the car, I know the car wasn't processed like it should have been. 
you know, when I graduated from the academy, we were taught to treat a missing person case exactly like a homicide case. You go to their house, you get their hair samples from their hairbrush, you do this, you get samples of their, of their fingerprints, whatever you need to do to, con to conduct a missing person case exactly like it's a homicide. Uh, then it was exactly about 10 days later is whenever the, her body was discovered. And her body was discovered because there was a, a young boy that was riding his bike out there on uh, around their, their field out there and, and he smelled an odor and he went back to tell his dad that he thought one of the cows had, had died. And his dad went out there and discovered her body at that point. My boys and I were at a friend's house and my niece was visiting us and, and I was called by the sheriff's department and they asked me to come take pictures. An employee of the uh, Claremore Progress, the newspaper here in town, was the one who actually took the crime scene photos for the police departments and the OSBI, which is unusual. I did that all the time. Uh, there were others in my office that did that, that took crime scene photos too. But um, at that time, there weren't photographers everywhere and deputies didn't have cameras and you couldn't take a picture with your phone. or. I can close my eyes and see almost everything of these horrible things that I've seen. But I do not dwell on them. I do not try to remember them. And I won't go to bed tonight thinking of them. But I've seen my first incident was a guy who was beheaded uh, when an overload struck the top of his car. That was my first incident, and that would be enough to scare you off, but I, I just, I th I'm a very strong person, but I do not dwell on that. I won't say they don't bother me. It bothers me to recall. I think the Laura Long one bothers me more than any of them. And I just loaded up my kids, because they had to go everywhere with me. I was a single mother. Their father was in the military, and when, they had to go with me everywhere. So the, my two sons and my niece were in the car with me. We drove out to the scene. And when we got there, there were lights flashing every place. There was dozens of vehicles there, sheriff's department, ambulance. And I took the crime scene photos. Being, it was July, hot, and it, her body was in terrible shape when it was discovered. It was decomposed. Uh, it was already mummified. She was so bad shape that they couldn't even tell if she'd even been raped or anything because her body's in such bad shape. And all the only thing they could do uh, for her funeral was just put what was left of her body in a, in a casket and put sprinkle it with lye. And that was all they could do for her. I, I guess I'm glad none of us found her. I don't know. Cause they wouldn't let us see her at all. The undertaker, Jim Smith, he said, there's no way I would ever let you see any part of it. So it's a matter of them gathering up the evidence, you know, uh, getting the ME out there to pick up her body and uh, see if there's anything they could do to determine the cause of death through the ME's office. What the ME medical examiner's office determined was she died of suffocation. They poked her sock down her throat. And that's what killed her. Strangled, choked her to death. I felt I, I just ha kept having in my head this thing of why didn't you get out front with this? Why did you wait? And you know, several people convinced me that she would probably died before before I could have gotten anything in the paper. But um, that was the thing when when that night the first thing I thought of is why did I wait? I was off work for a month because I couldn't couldn't function, and my neighbor next door, well, two of my neighbors more or less carried me through it, and I cried for two years. I don't cry anymore. I don't have any tears anymore. So how do you think the police department handled this case? <laughs> 
that was a that's a difficult one for me to add, to answer. It really is. I know that they run into some problems. That there was uh, questions about whose jurisdiction it was going to be. You know, uh, the Claremore Police Department said it was their case because it was a missing person out of their, out of, their of our city. Uh, the Rogers County Sheriff's Department thought it was their case because she was her body was found out there in uh, the county, and the OSBI, who has jurisdiction anywhere in the state of Oklahoma, said it was their case. But maybe there were too many fingers in the pot. The police department back then is a small department. When I started in '76, the Claremont Police Department was consisted of 18 officers, including the chief. But we had no more than two or three officers on duty at any given time. And they're busy, you know, having to control the traffic down here and, and answer their calls at, at the same time. So it's, they're scattered up pretty good, so. Like I say, Amos Ward, I think, was the sheriff, who was very famous around here. Everybody called him Famous Amos, as a matter of fact. He was a drunk and hmm, no good at all, I think. He was not a good man. They thought he was, up there, yeah. Every now and then I would call down and see if they'd found out anything at the sheriff's department. No. Well, his wife found out that I was calling, and she called me a uh, publicity hound. I wanted to be noticed. And I told her, I said, I don't know how you would hate, have it, how hold it, if your daughter was killed, because she had a daughter. Not, she didn't say anything back to me. Jack Tanner was the undersheriff, which was the head deputy. He said, we were in the hallway of the sheriff's department, and he said, uh, well, Ms. Long said, uh, we don't have any money to continue the investigation of Laurie's murder. And I said, what do you mean? By golly, you get paid whether you're doing anything or not and you do your job, and he wanted us to give him money. I know that's what he wanted. Technically, the person that should, or the agency that should have had complete jurisdiction would probably been the OSBI, and that the Claremont Police Department and the Sheriff's Department would be there to assist them, because they have jurisdiction all over the state of Oklahoma. I don't think they did their job either. And see, this was a month, almost a month, and a couple of days or maybe three or four days after the Girl Scout murders. That's why they didn't do anything, I think. They, they let that overwhelm this, as far as I can see. The Girl Scout murder thing got the big publicity. I, I know Ima was very upset about that because she felt like that, that took away from her case. And, uh, yeah, the big it, the Girl Scout murders made big headlines. I mean, yeah, it was nationwide news and stuff. So I'm sure they pulled off uh, all all the agents they can. But I still don't think they did what they should have done. Uh, investigated it because they were too interested in the Girl Scout murders. That's really what I thought, and I still think that. All three agencies eventually started working together. You could see where they divided up people to interview. Uh, you know, Claremore Police Department would run stuff up to the lab there in Tahlequah, to the OSBI lab when stuff was found. Uh, people would call in tips or whatever, or they try to interview as many, as many people as they could that they found out what that was at the Nemo Shopping Center. And they try to interview people that she knew to try to determine who was the last person to see her alive. There's always a rumor mill, and there were rumors, and there were rumors about everything. There were rumors about who it was, and you know, and who her boyfriend was at the time. And There was one boy she had dated for a while in high school, I think, and we went and talked to him first, and he didn't know anything. He still doesn't. He was eliminated as a suspect pretty early on. It was a rumor mill, as you would, as you would expect, I guess. Uh, Somebody would theorize something and so-and-so did it and they'd follow him up. And just every little rumor we had to follow up on, if we got a, anything at all, we'd follow up and ask questions about it. And what they did at that point in time, they did what they call a polygraph out, where they just brought in everybody they thought were good suspects and polygraphed them. My publisher said, I want something in the front page of the Claremont Progress every single day as to what they did the day before. The, the newspaper had a good reputation as being uh, fair and bulldogs 
We were bulldogs when anything was going on. We wanted to get to the bottom of it, although we weren't investigators. I wouldn't even attempt to say that I was qualified to investigate a murder. But I was willing to talk to anybody who came in my door and said, I can tell you something about the Laura Long murder. I was willing to listen. But what I would try to do when, when people would contact me was I would try to get them in contact with the police officer. Believe it or not, back in those days, two people come all the way from Joplin to drive down here just to cruise Main Street, you know. So, you know, there's possibilities. It could have been somebody from Joplin. It could be, you know, all these possibilities were who could have been a suspect. I was watching a TV show one night where uh, Ted Bundy, who was a serial killer up in the Northwest, had escaped from jail up there somewhere and he went to Florida where he eventually got caught and he was convicted down there. And there was a frame of time there he was on the loose and I thought, well, if he went from Florida, or from the Northwest to Florida, maybe he was loose and he came through Claremore. So I got on the phone and I called the very detectives that arrested him in Florida. They told me that at the time that he had been in jail at the time of the Laura Long murder. So that eliminated him as a suspect, so that was out of the case. But I've typed up a report on that and put it in the file also. I know they went down there. Jack Tanner and uh, Bob Colbert, he was a detective on Claremont PD at the time went down there. A couple of officers went down to Texas to go interview him in prison to see if there was a possibility he may have come through Claremore to commit this crime. And then if you read the interview, it, it, it was a perfect example when you teach an officer at the police academy on how not to interview because they were like leading questions. Like they were asking this person, like, could she have been wearing a halter top? You know, could she have been doing this or anything? Practically giving them the answers. The answers. And of course, the gentleman admits, yeah, that he did it. And they took that information to the DA's office, and the DA said, there's no way we've got enough to file charges on him. Later on, we found out it was just to gain more time to keep him from being executed because eventually he did recant, and then they could prove that he wasn't even in this area at that point in time. Uh, like I say, we followed down every lead and tracked every, even a ghost of a lead like the one in, with Ted Bundy and the guy in Texas, you know, all of them. We followed them up in some way or another. They all panned out to be a dead end. Uh, see, I started working for Claremore in 1989 after I left Tulsa because I had like one weekend off. I left Tulsa in 89, went straight two days off, went straight to work for Claremore. I was assigned to investigations in 1992. Well, what I did was just basically start. One of my first things I wanted to do was try to locate to see if there was any evidence still available. So it was a matter of trying to locate that, which I contacted a, an investigator with the Sheriff's Department and just requested from him if they had any of Laura Long's evidence in their evidence locker. So it was a matter of locating all of that to see once we got that located, see if there was enough that we felt like that we can send off now to the lab for the OSBI to do DNA testing or see if there was anything that we could get DNA off of or as a possible suspect. There was a friend of mine who was an FBI agent who was getting ready to go off to a training session in Dallas on, on profiling. And I asked him if he would mind taking her case file with him and maybe him and his instructor could uh, look it over and see what they thought. And at that point in time, he did. And uh, he presented the case to his instructor and they, they went over everything on, on the case file. In his opinion, the kind of person we were looking for was somebody of an authoritative figure uh, and probably an athletic type guy. Uh, and that he was also probably a good old country boy. You know, he probably wore bib overalls and an old straw cowboy hat. And that he probably drove an old pickup truck, you know, and lived in an old mobile home or a trailer or something is what he suggested that uh, kind of person we're looking for. But he said in, the, in this case that they've had in old cases like that, it was the anniversary of, of Laura's death coming up. Uh, I think it was the 20th anniversary of her death was coming up. 
that we put a big deal out in the newspapers and in the press, everybody to let them know that we're reopening the case because of the new technology, you know, the new DNA stuff, new lab stuff to put out there the word for publicity. Uh, it was probably about maybe oh, three or four days or a week later, I got an anonymous letter addressed to me. 